it's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch, now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Put your hands together while we welcome everybody that's on live with us, that's on Facebook. Amen. Praise God. We welcome you. We thank God for you being here. Um, are we on live? Y'all give me a thumbs up. All right. Amen. So glad to have you. Grab your Bible, take some notes, and get ready to experience a better life than the one that you've been living. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this yet another opportunity to receive a word from you. I believe that I've heard from you and what you have shown me is so precious to me. I pray that it be received in the good ground of every person's heart, not only those that are here, but those that are watching live or later online. We ask that the Holy Spirit do a work on the inside of us. Let not one of us leave the same way that we came, but let us all be changed in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you will open with me in your Bible to the book of Amos chapter 3. In a moment, I'm going to read what is our text for a brand new series that we just started a couple of weeks, well, last week. And so our foundational text, this in other words, no matter where we go today, at the root or at the base of it, Amos 3.3 is the connecting link. In verse 3, the Word of God says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? What's the answer to that question? Well, it implies that you, you can't be together if you're not in agreement. If, if one person wants to go this way and the other person wants to go that way, they can't be together if they don't agree in the direction that they're going. One translation even says, can two people walk hand in hand except they are in agreement or agree to do so? Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, our second foundational text for this message, in verse 14, he says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? You say, well, where are we going with this verse? Particularly in the first part, he talks about being unequally yoked. A yoke, uh, particularly in that day, they were agricultural society, a yoke is a device. Matter of fact, all of us have a yoke in our car. Um, there's an there's a, there's a auto part that ties the two front wheels together. How many of y'all know if you got one wheel going this way and one <laughs> wheel going that way, you're going to wear something out or tear something up because they're, they're not in agreement. One wants to go left and the other one wants to go right. So he says, don't be unequally yoked together. So not only are you yoked, but you want to make sure there's a balance or that there's an agreement there. And then he says specifically together with unbelievers. Well, we know that this is referring to people that don't believe in Jesus Christ. But when you believe differently than someone else, to them, you don't believe. You're an unbeliever about certain thoughts or ideas or even philosophies. So it shows here that it's important to be yoked together and to be in agreement with those that we are in relationship with. With that in mind, we are continuing our series that's called, What Kind of Church Are We? If you're visiting uh, or if you're checking us out online, if you're thinking about visiting Faith Family Church, over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about who we are as a church. Or a better way to say it is, what kind of church is this? You know, Faith Family Church, that's kind of generic. Is this a Baptist church? Is this a Methodist church? Well, I don't see any particular affiliation with a denomination. Well, what kind of church is this? And so we'll take time to look at that. But um, the second part, if you could go back, I'm sorry. The second thought that we want to look at during this time is what kind of person are you? So while you're checking us out, we want you to check yourself out as well. And here's the idea 
Um, can two walk together in agreement? Maybe you're looking for a new church home or, you know, we want to take time to make sure that, that the, 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 the church and the members of the church are in agreement, that we're going in the same direction so we can accomplish the plan of God. Essentially, uh, go back one more time. Uh, essentially, this is a series about core values. It's a series that's talking about core values. Now, with that in mind, um, I want you to note this statement. When you talk about core values, core values are fundamental beliefs of a person or organization. One of the things that my mother taught me, one of the things that my mother taught me is that in life you want to um, understand a person's philosophies of life. If you're going to be in a serious relationship with a person, then you really need, need to get to know who they are as a person. Amen? And, and essentially what you want to find out is what are their life philosophies or what are their core values? How many of y'all know Amos 3.3 really is a strong marriage scripture? Think about it. If you're in a marriage relationship, can, can that marriage walk together if they're not in agreement? If they're not in agreement, either one's going to be dragging the other one or there's going to be tension or there's going to be resistance or we're never going to be able to go anywhere. Right. So we'll be able to apply what we learn in this series, not only to the church relationship, but to our everyday life relationship. So my mother taught me very early on, if you're going to be in a serious relationship with someone, take the time to find out what are their philosophies of life? What are their core values? The core values is what is fundamental to a person or an individual. <clears throat> uh, Maya Angelou made this statement. I'll never forget it. Oprah Winfrey, she quotes it often. When, when someone shows you who they are, who they really are, believe them the first time. <laughs> Let's say you're going out on a date. Let's say you're an unmarried person. And this is good because if you're unmarried, if you're going to walk through life, you want to do it in agreement. You don't want to have to submit through life. Now, I get that the Bible does say wives submit to the husbands. Let all the husbands say amen. amen. You know, but, <laughs> but, but, but in all honesty, when I, one of the first things I talked to my wife about when we were on our first date, even before as we began to pursue a marriage relationship, we talked about agreement. I share with her that my heart's desire is that we do everything in life through agreement so that I don't have to submit to her and she doesn't have to submit to it. If we see eye to eye on it, then we can go ahead and do it without any tension on either other part. Think about it. Bonnie and Clyde, even though they did a lot of bad things, they agreed on one thing, robbing banks. All right. They, maybe they argued about which bank to rob, but they were in agreement about robbing banks. Amen. So when someone, shows you, when someone shows you who they really are, believe them the first time. If you're on a date and, and you see the person you're dating go off like, like, like overboard at the movie theater, and you're thinking like, hmm, that was a little bit much. Hey, <laughs> somebody said run. If you give them a pass and that's a, that you wouldn't handle that that way, you, you know, and, and especially, see, over time, if you keep making a pass and then you get married, now you're expecting them to change who they are. And guess what? Normally, people don't change for other people. People will change when they experience God in a meaningful way. But normally, people don't change for other people. See, people know themselves much better than you do. That's why it's important to stop expecting them to be something other than who they are. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be in a series uh, just I, I don't know how long it'll take, but I believe it'll, it'll empower your life. We want you to know who we are as a church because we want to be in a serious relationship with you, whether it be online or here in, in the, this location, we want to be in a serious way. So we want to expose to you what's really, really significant. What's core to us? What matters most? What's hot? What do we value above all things? Amen? And then secondly, we want to challenge you while you're going through this, exam this series to examine who you are as a person and endeavor, endeavor to be a better person. So while we're defining what kind of church we are, 
I'm challenging you to be that same kind of person. And obviously through this, if you see eye to eye with us, if we're passionate about the same kind of things that you're passionate about, I wouldn't be surprised if it is that you're in the right place and, and we're supposed to be your faith family. So three things we looked at. And uh, first things are first. I mean, uh, there's a ton of things that, we, that are valuable to us. But when you list something as number one, how many of y'all, you, basically, you're saying this is most valuable to us, all right? So the number one thing that, that, that we're val- that, that's a core value for us is we are a word church, a word church. What we're challenging you to consider through what we've seen in the word is to be a word person. That above all, all that you value, I value family, I value love, I value you know, hard work, a lot of things that you can value in life. But what I'm challenging you to value above all things in your life is to be a word person. In other words, do what Jesus said. Man can't live by bread alone, but by every word. If you're a word person, you're going to make sure that every day you get a word from God. You'll read your chapter. You'll spend time with him. The second thing is we're a faith church and we really are. That's really big on the list. And number three, we're a grace church. If you want more about that, then check us out. Listen from where we were last week. All right. On what kind of church are we? What we're going to look at today, number four, is we are a praying church. We're a what? A praying church. And what we want to challenge you to be through this is to be a person of prayer. Man, I wish I could push this up higher because it's extremely, extremely important But it's high enough on the list. And where do we get that from? In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12, Jesus said this. Well, the Bible says this. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seeds of those who sold doves. So I want you to get this picture. One of the things I say that you should do when you read the chapter is imagine being there. I want you to imagine on one day you're hanging out at the temple and all of a sudden you see Jesus. He's really famous. He comes in, but he's got this scowl on his face and he's looking at what's going on. And all of a sudden, someone said he makes a whip and he drives out the people that are in the temple selling doves. They're making money in the temple. They're they're, they're changing money. They they were carrying wares. The book of Mark said that they were carrying merchandise in the church, you know, or or in the temple, the the, the congregation, the gathering of the people. And he overturned. I mean, he flipped over tables. How many of y'all know he's really passionate about this? And listen to what he says next. In verse uh, 12, I mean 13, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a what? A den of thieves. So we're talking about the church. We don't call the church the temple today, but it's a very, it's the same in in type. It's where the people of God gather to worship him. That's what they did in the temple in that day. Guess what? That means we shouldn't be merchandising in the church. What Jesus specifically said is my house, and he's referring to my church. So he, what, is, what is history church supposed to be? A house of what? Prayer. If we're known throughout, if we're known throughout the, the city, if we're known throughout the state, if we're known around the world for anything, how many of y'all know we ought to be known as a house of play, prayer? In other words, it should be that people, whether saved or unsaved, can come to a church and get prayer. Oh, come on, somebody. It ought to be that we are known as a church. And so because of that, we're very passionate about prayer. What I challenge you is this, is that you should be a person of prayer. Every success in life is a prayer success first. John Wesley, who is the founder of the uh, 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 of the Methodist Church, the Wesleyan movement. He made a statement. It seems as though God is limited by our prayer life. It says, though he can do nothing for humanity unless somebody ask him. Think about that statement. That means that God can't do anything for you or I unless somebody ask him to do it. You know, a lot of times people stand in pulpits and they say with great authority, God is in control. 
Now, we would ask you a trick, trick question. How many of you all believe this is a trick question? <laughs> How many of you all believe that God is in control? Most all of us, because of the way we believe, believe that God is in control. Well, let me ask you a question. If God is in control of everything that's happening on the planet, then we should not serve God. Because there were some really, really bad things that happened to kids last night all over the planet. There were some really, really dark things that took place. There were some murders that took place. You know, a child was hit by a vehicle or something really, really, uh, you know, someone drowned. Or if God is in, see, I'm, I'm messing with your theology. Somebody said, go for it. All right, I got, I got permission. <laughs> If God is in control of everything that happens on the earth, then we're in trouble because there's a lot of bad things, come on, that he's in control of. But here's the thing. He's not in control of everything that happens on earth. How many of y'all know he's in control of everything that happens in heaven? Come on. Now I got some amens in the church. God is in control of everything that happens in heaven. There's no crime in heaven. There's no dying in heaven. There's no tears in heaven. There's nothing bad that happened last night. Jesus came and taught us. He said, pray to the Father. Thy will be done. Come on. On earth as it is in heaven. What that means is God is not in control. The earth, the heavens, even the heavens belong to the earth, to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Amen. So what that means, though, is this. In order to get God to do something in the earth, you got to ask him because he's a gentleman. He's not just going to override and make you do what he wants you to do. If that's the case, he'd override the will of every human, human being. He'd cause all of them to be the same today, and we'd go into glory tomorrow. But he's not going to override your, override your few free moral agency, your, your free will. He gives you the ability to choose life and death. He gives people the, the ability to choose good things and to choose bad things. But if you pray and ask him, he'll get involved with what takes place on the planet. I approve of that statement. It seems as though God is limited by our prayer life. It is though he can do nothing for humanity unless somebody asks him. He went on to say if that is it, because this is the case, then those who know how to pray should do more of it. The very next verse in verse 14 after he said my house should be called a house of prayer, then the blind came to the temple. The lame people came to the temple and he healed them. What I simply want you to see is he was able to do what should be happening in the church. In other words, miracles, signs, and wonders are the result of prayer. When the church becomes a church of prayer like he ordained it to be, then people will be able to come and get help. In Acts chapter 2, here's some supporting scriptures and I'll go through these quickly. Verse 41 says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized that day. About 3,000 souls were added to the church. Look up at me. How many of y'all are okay with Faith Family Church getting big? Amen. Amen. Now, what's funny is sometimes people who visit us for the very first time, they'll say, ooh, we, I like a little small church. You know, I'm not really into big churches. You know, I like small churches and I get uncomfortable when they say it. I don't tell them because I want them to be able to get connected. <laughs> But we won't be small for long. Why? Because we serve a big God and there's a lot of people that could benefit from this kind of ministry. Amen. So 3000 people got saved in verse 42. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread. And say that last part with me. And in what? So I want you to I want to show you that from the beginning of the church. The church was heavily involved in prayer. Notice that the day they're referring to as the church, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. In other words, Peter, James, John, the other apostles, they would teach the word of God, but then the people would continue. They didn't have a, a podcast, but we do. 
Come on, they didn't have an app on their phone where they could hear the message again, but we do, right? And so they kept the word of God. The word of God was really important. What else? Fellowship is really important to a church. Listen, you can get a great message on the Internet or on TV. Why then do you need to come to church? If the church is just about getting a great message, then we could stay at home. We don't have to come to church. But that's not the full purpose of the church. There's a second important meaning of the church, and that's for fellowship. That's where you get to break bread with one another. We get to know you and you get to know us. Amen. Later on in the month of March, we're going to have us an old fashioned fish fry on a Sunday morning. There's going to be over 350 people in the building. I can guarantee you it's going to be mm -mm good. Right. So it's important that when we have those times to get the word, we get the word. But what else is important is what? Fellowship. Somebody say fellowship. fellowship. What's a third thing that's really important in a church? Somebody say prayer. Prayer. Prayers. <clears throat> Verse 43. Watch this. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Notice the connection again. When prayer takes place, miracles. Come on. Signs. Come on. And wonders should be happening. Just a few verses later in chapter three and verse number one, the Bible says that when Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, notice Peter and John went to the temple. That's the church. You know, today we call it the church. Back then they called it the temple. They went to the church at an appointed time. They had a, 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 a prayer service at the church. Come on. That's what he said. He said, my house shall be called what? Come on, y'all talk to me and be what? A house of prayer. And so there were scheduled times of corporate prayer. What am I saying to you? We are a praying church and I'm challenging you to be a praying person. We here have a prayer conference call on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And if you're online, the number is 319-527-3036. We invite everybody to call in and be a part of prayer. Listen, we're praying. You can go to the next. We're praying for people's lives. Notice when they went into the temple at the hour of prayer, there was a certain man who was crippled from his mother's womb, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which was called beautiful to ask alms of them to make a long story short. This man, because the church was a church of prayer, Peter was a man of prayer. This man ended up being healed of his infirmity as a result of the church being a church of prayer. In Acts chapter 12 and verse number five, <coughs> excuse me, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by who? The church. So notice a little bit later, and I'm trying to go fast because the last half of this message is real intimate to my heart, and I'm trying to get to that part. Um, oh, go back. I wasn't done. I'm going to do the two highlights. In Acts chapter 12, Peter found himself in a bad situation. Is there anybody here who's ever been in a bad situation? Yes. Well, when you belong to a church, your church should be praying for you. When you have a pastor, my number one job description, if I don't do anything else, if I don't stand in the pulpit to preach, my number one job is to pray for you. The Bible says um, that, 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 that you should uh, uh, honor those that watch for your souls. If you have a pastor, he should be looking out. He should be Godward. He should be like, like Moses was for the children of Israel. His face ought to be in the face of God. My full-time job is to pastor you. When you go to IBM or AT&T or, or the U.S. Postal Service, wherever you work, and you're putting in your 9 to 5, my 9 to 5 is praying for you. While you're dealing with the devil on the job, while you got situations going on at home, you got somebody that's praying, that's calling out your name two, four times a week. We're lifting you up. That's very, very important. If you don't have a pastor, if you don't have a church, man, but when you have a pastor, when you have a church, you've got folks that are praying. Peter was kept in prison. Constant prayer. Somebody say constant prayer. 
So not only should we be a church of constant prayer, but you should be a person of constant prayer. Prayer was made by the church. <clears throat> we know he got out of that bad situation. One last one is in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. They stoned Paul to death. The Jews of Antioch and Iconium came there having persuaded the multitudes. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Verse 20. But note, how many have ever been in a bad situation where people basically left you for dead? As far as you're concerned, they stoned you with words. They stoned you with accusations. And, you know, and they have left you in a bad situation. But look what happens when you got a church. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed to with Barnabas to Darby. Notice what I'm getting excited. Oh, man, I'm getting excited. Why? Because let's say you're Paul and you've been beat up by life. They were they heard, you know, maybe they weren't there with Paul, but they, yeah, Paul, they stoned him. Really? Where is he at? They drug him out of the city. I don't know. They went looking for him. They found him and they gathered around him. I'm sure they weren't like, dang, look at him. Oh, that is so bad. I feel so sorry for Brother Paul. Oh, whoa, we're so bad. No, come on. Because the church gathers for prayer. Because the church knows the power of prayer. They gather, God, this is a good man. God, we love him. God, raise him up. And the next thing that happened, a miracle took place. Sometimes we're in bad situations in our marriages. Sometimes we're in bad situations where our children are concerned. Or we're in bad situations where our finances are concerned. You let us get wind of it. I challenge you, write, write your prayer request down on that connect card. Drop it in that offering receptacle. We got a prayer team at Faith Family Church that provides constant prayer. And then we gather for corporate prayer and we believe you will get an answer. Woo, man. So we are very, very passionate about prayer here at Faith Family Church. Um, I'll talk about this later on. It's important to us, but not as important as these other things. We do believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We do speak in tongues. This is a disclaimer. The Bible says that he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh unto men, excuse me, speaketh unto God and not unto men for for no man understands him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Okay, so when we're on the prayer conference call, you might hear me, because I'm one of the leaders of the prayer. You might hear me pray to God in tongues. Now don't send me no email talking about, well, you need to interpret the tongues that you was praying. Because the Bible said that if they speak in a tongue, let it be interpreted. That's if I was speaking in tongues publicly here now. We're not in a prayer service. If God wants to declare a message through that means, then it needs to be interpreted. But we'll get to that. Wink, wink. Disclaimer. If you are uncomfortable with hearing people speak in tongues, don't call the prayer line. <laughs> but I don't know about you. If there's some things going on and I'm, I need somebody to pray for me and they don't know what's going on. Shoot, pray in tongues for me. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> ah, in Mark chapter 1, we know Jesus is a man of prayer. So we should follow his footsteps. In the morning, having risen a long while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. Notice he got up. It was a priority for his life. He got up before work, before his day got started, and he departed, and he did what? He prayed. Amen. And then notice this in chapter 6, when he had sent the people away, he departed into the mountain to pray. Sometimes when you're giving out and serving others, you need to take some time, get, get by yourself and spend some time in prayer. Why? If prayer was important to Jesus, you better believe it's important to you. And prayer is inviting God to do in your life what only he can do. He can't just do it. You have to invite him to do it. Jesus was a man of prayer. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his steps. We are called, my house shall be called a house of prayer. How many of y'all know we should be a people of prayer? All right. So you have a calling on your life where prayer is concerned. And then second to that, we should follow his steps. We should what? Follow his steps. Jesus was a person of prayer. I'm challenging you 
to be a people of prayer. Every Tuesday, Thursday, we've got prayer. We've got people that, like 20 plus people that are on the God. I'm expecting that number to shoot up and just keep shooting up and that people will find out all, of, all over the city. If you got something you need to pray for, just give it to me. I'm going to give it to my church. Come on, and we'll get an answer. Amen? All right, so number four, what kind of church are we? All right, number five. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says this. I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. Notice Jesus in this passage is talking about building his church. So what should be a core value to the church? He says here that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's talk about a gate for a minute. Uh, you've got two things. You've got a gate and a fence. A fence is not a gate, and a gate is not a fence. A gate is an opening in a fence, or it's simply an opening. So when you talk about a gate of hell, this is like a doorway into hell. So notice he's not saying that, you know, the church is holed up and hell is beating the church up and we'll be able to hold up the gate of, hell, of, of the church. It's the opposite. The church is attacking hell, trying to save people out of it, and we get them out through the gates, but they also got into hell through the gates. There are two gates of hell that we as a church family are assigned to attack in our community. I was listening at a conference, and I believe his name was McPherson, um, and he talked about a, a church should identify in their community a gate of hell or gates of hell and then attack that specific area. For example, if we were a church in San Francisco and homosexuality was a really big, big deal, you know, and, and people suffer in homosexuality, then we could really go against that. Or if we are in our community, there are two gates of hell that are that I've identified. The first is fatherlessness, and the second is divorce. And number five and number six, don't put them up. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm setting up. Number five and number six are high value priorities for who we are as a church. And if you all will permit me the next 15 or so minutes to talk to you from my heart about two gates of hell that we're assigned to attack. Is that okay? Yeah. I really need you to lock in. So we are, number five, a fishers of men church. What do we mean by that? Fatherlessness is an entry point into someone experiencing hell on earth. In other words, there are people in our community that are essentially fatherless and they're experiencing hell in their life. They're suffering. And hell essentially has them in hold because of fatherlessness. And we want to attack that. Let me talk about that. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, it says this. So Jesus said to them, all of you uh, will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Notice the B part of that verse that Jesus says that if you strike the shepherd, the head, the one who's in charge, then the rest will be scattered. I like to read this. If you strike, if you get the man, in the family, then the rest of the family will be messed up. So when we talk about what kind of church we're a fishers of men church, um, I want to make this statement. What happens to the man affects, the man of the family affects the whole family. How many of y'all know that to be true? For this reason, we are a fatherless church. What happens to the man of a family affects the whole family. And uh, in Mark chapter 1, 
Verse 16, I want to show you this. He, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting nets, two men and by the sea, and they were fishermen. And verse 17, then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you to become a what? Fishers of men. Notice, we know Jesus is selecting his disciples. He said, follow me. Jesus did not select a politically correct ministry team. He could be accused of being chauvinistic because there wasn't one woman apostle. I got, I got some loud. He got quiet in the church. He picked all men. Why? Because what happens with the man affects the whole family. Um, so he targeted men while ministering to women and children. Why? I'm going to show you. Um, fishers of men. Go ahead. Jesus targeted men while doing what? Ministering to women and children. So one of the things that we do because we, we see Satan's work in our community is we target men while ministering to women and children. And I want you to notice in the church, typically uh, women and children are, are the predominant demographic. In most churches, oh, don't go, don't, no, 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 I'm sorry. Um, in, in most churches, we, uh, women and children are the predominant demographic. There's sometimes men, and in a strong church like this, you'll have a bunch of men. But there's an absent demographic in every church, and it's a male between 18 and 28 years old. It's almost very rare to find a man who's in the church that's in that category. And I'm about to show you some things. Um, so God knew that what happens with the man affects the whole family. So what did he do? He targeted men. Here's a statistic. There's a statistic that says that if a child, don't go, don't go yet, just yet. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about this picture, and after I talk about this picture, then you can go. Sorry. Sorry. Um, there's a statistic that says if a child goes to a church event and gets saved, there's a 5% chance that the rest of his family, if they're all, if they're all unsaved, there's a 5% chance that the rest of that family will get saved and follow that child to Christ. There's a 17% ch chance if a woman goes to the church that the rest of her family will follow. We know if a woman goes, she'll get their kids there, but very rarely would the husband follow the woman. But if, somebody say, but if. If a man goes to a church event and gives his life to Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about they already saved. I'm talking about a person who's unsaved. If an unsaved man goes to a church event, gives his life to Jesus, 93% of the time, his wife will get saved, his kids will get saved, his brothers will come, come on, his sisters will come. Hallelujah. What happens with the head affects the whole family. So in our marketing, there's a specific demographic that we're targeting. We target dads with kids. So what you may see, and I want to tell you in advance because we're very passionate about this, because of what some things I'm about to show you, we target men with kids. We, and it's not that we don't women, want women or kids to come. Please understand my heart. Um, especially if you're an unmarried woman, you ought to be like, yes, amen. We need more men in the church. <laughs> amen. I need to get married, you know, and I don't want to look in the world, right? I'm going to be able to find a husband in the church, so go get him, pastor. I got you, girl. I got you. <laughs> now, check this out. We want, we want dads who have kids, whether they're married and have kids or unmarried and have kids, we want them to feel really comfortable in a church like Faith Family Church. Right? And so we target that specifically. Let me tell you why. And then you can go. Um, I don't have my glasses, but I could, I could read it. There's some, you could go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. The census in 2011, just like in 2020, they're about to do the census. In 2010, they compiled. And in 2011, they gave a report. This is from census.gov. You can get it on cdc.gov. 
This is National Vital Statistics Report. This is not a poll. Somebody say, this is not a poll. All right, next one. We looked at the births, the first births in 2011. Uh, in this poll, there's a statement about births to unmarried women. And then there's a, a, a paragraph right there that talks about in 2011, um, 40.7% of all births were to unmarried women. Look up at me for a moment. Think about that. If you see a baby in a stroller, there's a 40% chance that when that baby was born, the biological mom and dad were not married. And that's of any race and any ethnic group. 40% of every child is born. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Because if mom and dad are not married, there's nothing to keep them together through the trials of life. And so if I stop getting along with you, we'll learn how to co-parent, which is like crazy. You know, that, that's like something new that we've adopted. Well, I'll do my dad on this. I'll do my dad's duty on this side. And even though we're not together, you do your mom's duty. And thank God for dads that are involved and moms that are. In, come on, y'all give me some better amens than that. Amen. But that's not the way God intended it to be. What happens is that child essentially gets raised in a home without their biological father. That's typically the case where the woman, and we've got some, some single dads here, and we celebrate you, we love you, and we applaud you. Come on, let's give, give praise and glory for our single dads. Amen. But children end up being raised in a fatherless home. And it does something on the inside of them. I'm going to show you that. If you look close, I'm sorry, I need to read that one. If you look closely, in 2011, these proportions were 17% API, 29% non-Hispanic white, 53% Hispanic births, 66% AIAN, and then 72% non-Hispanic black births. The proportions are essentially unchanged in 2010. Look up at me. This is serious. Yeah, 40% of every child is born, but when you break it down by ethnicity, listen carefully and understand why we at Faith Family Church are targeting as hard as we do. 17% is for Asian or Pacific Islanders. So if you see a, a, uh, uh, an, a, a woman of Chinese descent and she has a baby in a stroller, most likely she's married because only 17% of Asian women unmarried have a kid. That's good. 29% if it's a white person pushing a stroller. There's a high percentage, about 70% of the time that white person, that white woman is married. About 30% of the time that, that white woman is not married and she has a baby. For 53% um, if it's a Hispanic, if, if it's a Hispanic woman and she's pushing a stroller, about half of the time. 66% if she's an American Native Indian. 72.3% if she's African American. I was sitting at a table at a men's conference and General Boykin, who was a Caucasian man high up in the military, he says, you know that 72%, 72.3% of every black child born is born to a woman who's not married. 70, I'm not, I, the reason why I went through the effort to show you this, it's serious. It's like 29%, you know, 27% inverted. Next slide. And next slide. Okay, this is why. So whether it's 40% or 70%, there was another statistic put out by the government. There are negative effects of a child without a father can be seen countless studies and reports. The statistics show the importance of a father figure uh, in the majority of a child's life. According to what can the federal government do to decrease crime and revitalize communities? From the U.S. Department of Justice, this is not a poll. From the U.S. Department of Justice, Children from fatherless homes account for suicide 
63% of youth suicides are from kids who don't have their biological dad at home or an, a, a father figure. 63% of suicides. How about runaways? They found that 90% of homeless youths, 90% of runaway youths come from a fatherless home. High school dropouts, 71% of all high school dropouts. How about this? Juvenile detention rate. 70% of juvenile, juveniles in state-operated institutions don't have their dad at home. Substance abuse. 75% of adolescent patients in substance abuse centers. How about aggression? 75% of rapists motivated by displayed anger. Are you seeing a gate of hell? Man, it's quiet. Did I go too deep today? Okay. So at Faith Family Church, we are a fishers of men. Please don't charge me with being chauvinistic. But I'm targeting men while ministering to women and children. Because if you smite the shepherd, and think about it, if that's the case, if I, was, if I wanted to scatter the flock, I wouldn't go after the sheep. I'd go after the shepherd. I'd get more results. Matter of fact, I can get more sheep if I can get the shepherd out of the way. So what has Satan done? In order to increase his influence of hell in people's lives, <coughs> He's gone after the shepherd. The man of the family will have an effect on the whole family. God knew this. In Genesis 18 and 19, he chose Abraham. Why? Because I know him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord, do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring Abraham into what he has promised him. The same is true today. When you get a man that is, is giving his life to God, he will command his house after him. It's not like, baby, we going to church today. It's like, we going to church today. Y'all get ready. Come on. And a woman will gladly follow a man who is a man after God. So get the man and you get the whole family. Isn't that a wonderful strategy? So not only are we officials of men church, we are also number six, a marriage builders church. Let me get ready to close with this. Um, in Malachi chapter two and verse 16, the Bible says, for God, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed uh, to your spirit that you do not deal with treacherously. Divorce is another entry gate into a person experiencing hell in their life. When a person gets a divorce, it's like dividing who they are it's not two, it's one. How can you split this one and it be okay? You're gonna have to do some things to get it back right if you cut it in half. It's treacherous. It's been described as death while still living. When a person experienced divorce, it opens up a door of hell in their life. And it should be the church that attacks that gate and gets them out of that trouble and gets them into a, a safe place. Amen. So guess what? FA family, we're, we're about building marriages. He hates divorce. Somebody say he hates divorce. We're against divorce. We are pro-marriage. We're pro-marriage. We understand it happens. And when it happens, you can't unscramble an egg. But what we do is we believe that under every circumstance, there's a, there's a possibility for you to have a powerful and a happy home. Even if it's almost like you're building it from nothing, it's possible. Can I give you some statistics? Um, let me give you uh, chapter 
2 and verse 15, and then I'll give you some statistics, I think. But he did not make them one and, and, and having a remnant of the Spirit. Why did God choose marriage? Because he seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none, of the, uh, let none deal treacherously with the wife. So you say, well, why does God hate divorce? One of the reasons why God hates divorce is because of what happens to the offspring. I got a couple of yeses, so I need to emphasize it. One of the reasons why God hates divorce is because of the door that it opens in the life of the child. Now they're going to experience, now they got to figure out, okay, I'm with dad here and I'm with mom there. And, and why can't mom and dad be together? I can't, I wasn't made, I wasn't created to calculate that. All I know is that mom is supposed to be with dad. And when I see mom with him and dad with her, it, it affects me. And I can't describe that to you. And so that's why I'm fighting in school. And that's why I'm rebelling. And that's why I'm hurting myself. And I don't tell you because it doesn't make sense. So we are a marriage builders church. Let me say, you know, why don't you have an unmarried ministry? Well, we got a men's ministry and we got a women's ministry. And when we grow and get stronger, we will get an unmarried ministry. But above the men's ministry and above the women's ministry, because we are of Marriage Builders Church, because we are passionate about uh, attacking the gate of divorce in our community, we're going to minister to help marriages be strong, to help unmarried women that are not yet married know what this looks like. Amen. So so that when they do get married, they can have a strong marriage, praise God. Let me give you a statistic. You've heard it said, most people have heard the statistic that 50% of every marriage ends in divorce. Have you ever heard that? I'm corrected. That statistic originated in the 1980s and researchers believe that the rate of divorce has dropped a bit since uh, it has steadily dropped. Today, it is thought that approximately 42 to 45 percent of marriages, it's still bad, in the United States end in divorce, and this doesn't include uh, legal separation. This is another statistical finding. When you break down that number by marriages, 42 to 45 percent of first marriages end in divorce. It's just under 50%. If you were having a surgery on your toenail, because you have an ingrown toenail and it hurts, but the doctor said, you know, there's about 50% chance for you. And you're like, y'all gonna operate. Okay, yeah, yeah, we're gonna operate, but it's, a, it's like a 50-50. So are you sure you wanna do this? And you're like, doc, we're just talking about my toe, right? And you're like, well, maybe I don't understand what he means by 50%. You're like, you mean like there's 50% that you'll be able to fix it, right? No, it's like 50% that you might live or die through the surgery. Are you sure you want to get the toenail fixed? <laughs> Come on, man, right? That's easy, right? How many of y'all, y'all be like, yeah, <laughs> that's just how I walk. It's like, why you walk like that? No, that's, I mean, no, it meant actually, I mean, it's my toenail, but I'm good, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So now check this out. If you really knew that it's a 50-50 chance for this marriage to work, you would you'd slow down a bit. Don't be in such a hurry. Make sure you learn, make sure you know how to be a wife. Make sure you learn how to be a husband. I mean, who taught you how to be a husband? Well, dang, who taught me how to be a husband? Well, I learned from my mom and dad. Well, they divorced. My, my, my mom and dad are actually married, but I'm just saying, go through the list of who taught you what I learned from my mom and dad. Is that always the best example? No, right? Well, I, matter of fact, I, I taught myself. Really? You taught yourself how to be a husband? Okay, so let's see how that works. Oh, I learned in the locker room at the gym with the guys, you know, you don't let no woman talk, man. If I was you, man, I wouldn't let no, Woman talked to me, man, it was this guy. Come on, right? Oh, my, my girlfriends taught me how to be. I learned it. Oh, they taught me in college. I went to health school and they had a class on marriage, right? Was it a Christian school? No, I mean, it was just like, oh, wow. How many of y'all know? 
Go to the one who instituted marriage. Come on. Go to the one who invented marriage and let him teach you how to do this. And I believe our statistics will improve. I'm almost done. Matter of fact, I'm five minutes over time. So let me close with this. In second marriages, 60% of second marriages. I'm talking about the real statistic. Third marriages, 73%. And then check this out. I mean, who got reading glasses? Not like those are readers. Oh, you know, don't mess me up now. Man, man, I can see everything. <laughs> <laughs> These are divorce facts. In the United States, there is one divorce approximately every 36 seconds. That's a gate of hell. They're just flooding right into there. We need to get them out of that. Come on. That's nearly 2,400 divorces in one day in the United States. 2,400 divorces every day. 16,800 divorces per week and 876,000 divorces every year. The average length of a first marriage that ends in divorce is eight years and the probability of a first marriage ending in separation or divorce is in the first five years is 20%. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10 as I close. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to divorce her husband. But if she does divorce him, let her remain unmarried or get back with her husband. About 6% of marriages, about 6% of divorcees remarry each other. I think that's good. We can make that go up, be cool. But he said, if she does divorce him, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to what? Divorce his wife. I know that leaves a lot of questions. I'm just introducing to you all what kind of church we are and what we value highly. We are a pro-marriage church. And by all of this, all of these statistics, I challenge you to be a pro-marriage person. That means if you're talking to a friend or family member, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what they're going through, encourage them, go to God, get with a good pastor. There's a way out of no way. God can turn terrible situations around. And if they go off and, and, and just decide to divorce, they've not committed the unpardonable sin. Be pro-marriage, get them healthy, get them in a good place, help them get out of that place of hell and into a place of happiness. Amen? I'm out of time. Thank you all for being online. Share this with other people. I believe it's an important point in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Amen.